year, a little over a year, uh, with the whole COVID thing, the lockdowns and, you know, more severe in some places than others. But uh, it's put a lot of couples, a lot of families into close proximity for long periods of time under pressure and external pressures, financial pressures, job pressures, just the whole fear climate that we uh, have been under. Um, may not so much. That's another story. But th- it's it's we got a lot of divorces, a lot of people splitting up, a lot of marriages. It, kind of what we've done, I think, is, is expose some cracks in the foundation. And uh, there are cracks in a foundation that really is critical, not just to individuals who are in a marriage relationship, and to, but to families, to communities, and frankly, to the whole country. So this is this is a foundational bedrock kind of issue. So we're going to talk about marriage today, and maybe you're not married, maybe you're in a great marriage. Uh, these things are still really good to know. If you're in a relationship or going to get in a relationship, this will help you. This will give you knowledge to help be successful in that area. Uh, and, you know, if, if you're not in a, in a rough marriage, you probably know someone who is. How do you even talk to them? Well, again, we're going to give you some information and some knowledge to, to give you some hope, to give you some encouragement, to give you some, hopefully some wisdom for yourself and for those close to you. So with all of that, I would like to introduce my guest. Her name is Kimberly Holmes. She is the CEO of Marriage Helper. Uh, and Lord knows we got a lot of marriages that can use some help right now. Uh, and she's, we're going to talk about a lot of good things. I'm going to give you some resources uh, when we talk about podcasts and seminars and things like that. But, um, Carol, let's get into this topic. Welcome to Life Today Live. Thank you so much, Randy. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I am curious about one thing before we get into some of the details on the marriage thing, and that is why. Why do you do this? Oh, yeah. Great question. You know, the reason I do this actually stems back to, let's go back over 30 years ago, and it'll all make sense as I tie it together. But it was actually in the 1980s before I was born that my parents were married. They had been married at that point around 15 years, and they had my my two older sisters. And um, my dad, who was a very well-known man at that time, he was actually a preacher, and he was a very well-known preacher in the denomination that he was in. Well, he ended up believing that his life could be better if he were no longer with my mother. And it was one of those classic, he felt like the grass was greener on the other side and and left to honestly go and be with someone else. And they divorced. They were divorced for three years. And during those three years, he would tell you himself that he did things he never thought he would do, went places he never thought he'd go and became a man that he never thought he would be. And towards the end of that three years, he realized that he didn't even like who he was anymore. But even more than that, that green grass he thought that would be on the other side of that was not green. It was brown. It was dying. It was not what he thought it would be. So he actually went back to my mom and asked her if she would take him back. And she had already begun to move on. She was dating other people. They had been divorced for three years. And everyone in her life told her to not do it her family, her friends, they said, you're happy now, it's it's over. Why would you go back to that? How do you know you could ever trust him again? But my mom said, I just knew in my heart that he was a good person who had done some very bad things, but I believed it was the right thing to do to try and make this work. And so she took him back, they got remarried and they did not love each other at first. So they got remarried, even though they did not feel those feelings of love at the beginning, but they were dedicated and committed to try and figure out how to fall back in love and to make it work. And they did. And so with the help of of friends, of, of many different things, they were able to fall in love and they had me as a celebration of that second marriage. And so in one sense, Randy, I owe my existence to the mission that we do at Marriage Helper. But the second part of that is because of my parents' story and what happened, they said, how can we use what we went through to help other people not have to experience the pain and and all of the, the things that happened? I mean, they had the divorce. My two older sisters experienced divorce for the three years of their life. My, my middle sister was seven years old when they first divorced. My older sister was 12. And so those were pretty pivotal years of their life. 
but they still are experiencing some of the negative and adverse effects from, even though my parents got remarried and we have had a happy family for the past 30 years now. But because of their story, my parents actually founded Marriage Helper. So back in 1999, it was about 20 years after my parents actually, or about 10 years after my parents remarried, they, they founded an organization. My dad started this three-day workshop that over the past 20 years has had over a 70% success rate at saving marriages. We've had thousands upon thousands of couples go through it. We use the best research combined with knowing that it actually works in the lives of people people. And we have seen hundreds of thousands of marriages saved because of the story that originally started with my parents, but that I am passionate about because I wouldn't be here if it had not happened. Yeah. Well, okay. Um, first of all, congratulations on being born. Well done. Uh, Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but I got to tell you, that's one of the weirdest stories I've ever heard in this regard. They got married and didn't love each other, you said. Mm. How, how in the world is, uh, does that work? Is that even good advice? Oh, good question, right? So there's a couple of things to this. I wanna answer that first, just saying, well, if we look at research, we know that a couple doesn't actually have to be in love in order to have a great marriage because arranged marriages are very successful. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying we should do arranged marriages, but what I am saying is let's back it up a bit. There's actually a process to falling in love. And what my parents found and what we found at Marriage Helper and what we teach is that if you follow this process, that you can fall in love. If you stop following this process, then you can fall out of love, even if you don't mean to. So an interesting part of this is my parents did fall in love at one time, right? So the first marriage that they had, they had fallen in love. They, they had all of those feelings and experiences. So they weren't going into this completely blind. They just didn't have those feelings of love at the beginning of their second marriage because trust had to be rebuilt. Um, I mean, all of those things kind of had to happen again which they believed could happen, which is why they took the chance, but they didn't go off their feelings when they made that decision the second time. They went off what they believed was the right thing to do for them and especially for my two older sisters at the time. Uh, that's very interesting because, you know, I, I know everybody's like, you don't get married if you're not in love, you know, I mean, but so the idea that you can do something to, to follow, that you can build love, you can create love, I, nobody would argue the, the opposite. Nobody would argue that after years of marriage, you can fall out of love and, and just not want to be around this person. I think everybody's like, yeah, I totally get that. So it's, it's actually interesting that you're saying the reverse is, is true as well. Um, love, you mentioned the word feelings, and that's a, that's a mm -hmm. trigger for me. Uh, mm -hmm. it, how, what's the role of feelings in a good marriage, do you think? Hmm. Hmm. Well, when we are first starting in a relationship, feelings are all over the place. And right, because we feel very good things. There's excitement, there's novelty, there's um, intrigue, mystery, because you don't know as much about this person. They're, it's all new. And so as we're going through those first stages of a relationship, and that's actually the first part of falling in love, there's actually four stages. The first stage of it is attraction. Now, attraction is more than just physical attraction. There's actually four areas of it. But at the, at the basis of attraction is it is what makes me want to move closer to someone. So there's something about them that I'm intrigued by. I want to know more. I want to get to know them better. I want to move closer. There's a lot of feelings in that. Now, attraction never stops being important in a relationship, but here's what typically ends up happening. The longer you're with someone, you just, you had shared with me that you and your wife are about to celebrate a very marked anniversary. 30 years, know, 30 years, 30 years. 30 <laughs> years, which is amazing. And my husband and I just celebrated 10. So a third, a third of what you, you're experiencing. But both, I, I'm not going to speak for you. I can say that after 10 years of marriage, goodness, even after probably three or four years of marriage, the feelings weren't the same towards my husband as they were when we first started dating. They changed. And, but here's the thing. If I continue to go by my feelings, 
well, I no longer feel that spark when I look at him. I no longer feel that intrigue and mystery. So maybe I'm bored or Mary, maybe I married the wrong person, or maybe, you know, those are the things that th that's when feelings can lead us astray. If we try to make lifelong decisions based on feelings, when in reality, there are days I feel like I do not like my husband. I love him, but I definitely feel like he may be a jerk on that day. And oh, he yeah. feels the same about me, oh, right? Like oh, we yeah. can, get, we get on each other's nerves at times, sure. but I don't want to make long-term decisions based on short-term feelings because it's not the feelings that matter as much that I have towards my husband, as much as it is the commitment to do what it takes to make our relationship work long-term. I could not agree more. Uh, and <laughs> I made I made some kind of comment years ago about uh, I was probably a Valentine's Day, which I always forget uh, about, you know, well, it's not about love. It, it, it's about commitment. You know, and my wife kind of was like, you know, are you saying you don't love me? It's like, no, 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 right. no, no. why? And we hate the commitment word in most of culture today. Mm -hmm. uh, why is why why can you not separate love and commitment if you want the love to remain oh yeah so love without commitment is like jumping out of a plane without a parachute it feels <laughs> extremely exciting while you're doing it but it is very badly that is awesome. <laughs> it's so <laughs> it's true. It's, it's so, so true. true. It's so true because we even see this. I mean, you see this with when celebrities get divorces. I mean, we see it with regular people too, but it's noted in a society when it happens where, or even when they don't get divorces, when they never get married, they've been together for four or five years, but because they find someone else who's attractive or or whatever, they decide that, that they want to be with someone else, they can just end it so quickly. When you have a mindset that I can, I can leave this when it gets hard, or if I get bored, or if there's some, something else that comes along that's a better attractive alternative, then you're not going to put the same work into it as you do when you're committed. Think about it like home buying. You said that you were working on the, working on your house, you're all about to move. There's a difference in the mindset between renters and buyers. Buyers are committed. They're in it long term. When when something breaks, they fix it because they have to. Yeah, that's but true. when you rent, there's always an exit plan. Wow. And you're not going to take the same care of the house as you would as if you owned it. And it's the same in our relationships. It does not change. So that's why you won't see this in popular news. But research is very clear that when couples cohabitate before marriage, it actually decreases the satisfaction of future marriages, the likelihood that their marriage is going to be strong and last a long time. It increases their chances of divorce because now they have lived a life of basically having the quote unquote benefits of being married without the commitment of marriage. And that never leads to a good ending. You know, I, that that is such a strong illustration, the renters versus the buyers. And I'll tell you a couple of things that, that immediately come to mind. Yes, I do fix the things. The other thing I do in the house that I own is I, I upgrade. I'm continuously looking to improve. Yeah. And if you rent, you're not doing that. You're not putting the investment into it because it's really, you, you don't own it. And I think a lot of I mean, I know I've been guilty of this in my marriage is, is not, you know, how can I improve? How can I upgrade? How can this be better? Uh, and the other thing, and my daughter said this to me last night. She was visiting. She's about to get married and move out of state. She said, as we're as we're packing things, you know, she said, I, you know, this I'm not going to have my home anymore. And I said, well, sweetie, you're about to go create your own. You know, she mm. goes, yeah, I know, but she's been there since she was three years old. So this is the house that she grew up in with her four older or three older siblings. Um, and and when you when you have that sort of ownership of something, you have the memories, mm -hmm. uh, you you have the attachment that again in a rental house, you, you don't have that that kind of thing. I I just yeah, I love that. I, I have I want to 
moved, you mentioned there's four stages. So when, when the feelings go away and it, I don't know where you are in your marriage, you guys watching, but there will be days where the feelings are not there. And there will be days where the feelings are actually kind of negative. Uh, and you start to have thoughts and you have to decide what to do with those thoughts of, is this even right? Did I make a mistake? You know, and you know, 99 times out of a hundred, no, you just need to get your head right. Mm -hmm. What, talk about those four stages of fall, falling in love. Is that right? Is that the right terminology? Yes. Cause I think this is yes. important. This will help people. A marriage helper, we call it the love path. Okay. And so it has the four stages. The first one, as I mentioned before, is attraction, which is comprised of four areas, physical attraction, intellectual attraction, emotional attraction, and spiritual attraction. So we call it the pies, which is super fun because people who don't know about it are like blackberry, pecan, chocolate, like what kind of pies? Yeah. Not those kind of pies, but good for you in a different way. Um, and so the all four of those areas are really what make us attractive people. It's not just about how we look. It's about, is this someone that I can talk to? That's intellectual attraction. Do we have enough in common that we can share interests? Emotional attraction, this one's huge. This one is, does this person evoke an emotion within me that I enjoy feeling? When you're talking about a long-term relationship, that is key. Someone can be a supermodel, but if they don't evoke emotions within you, you like feeling, you're not going to want to be there. Spiritual attraction basically doesn't, it could have to do with faith. And definitely we see from research that couples that share similar faiths or similar beliefs and values end up having better marriages and stay together for longer periods of time. But spiritual attraction on a personal level has to do with, do I live in line with my beliefs and values? Do I have strong beliefs and values? Do I stand up for them? And all of those are what of those areas are what make up how attractive we are. And so as we're talking about how to fall in love, the process of falling in love, even if you're already married, on a daily basis begins with you. So on a daily basis, it begins with me. When I want, when I'm thinking about how can I make my relationship better with my husband, it's not by making the laundry list of here's all the things he needs to change. Cause I tried that. It doesn't work. <laughs> in instead, what works is saying, what can I do to continue to be a better version of me? What are the things inside me that needs to change? So that is number one. First stage and step of falling in love is attraction, which leads to that second step. So after we want to move closer to someone, want to get to know more about them, after we're attracted to them, the next thing is wanting to know more about them. And this is the part where we have to decide, do we accept the other person for who they are without wanting to change them. Now, this does not mean that we accept everything the other person may do. If my husband were an alcoholic, I could accept him as a person, but not accept the behavior. But it instead means, do can I love him? Can I be a safe place for him even when he struggles or goes through things? That's, that's the clearest I can get about acceptance in the short amount of time that we have. Well, let me, let me interrupt you because I think our culture is going in the opposite direction. In other words, what yes. I do is who I am. Mm -hmm. And you're suggesting that in order to have a healthy relationship and, and really maintain the attraction and, and build love, that we have to be able to separate who someone is from what they do. Is, am I, is that right? I mean, because I can take that in some probably some negative places, but I can take it in some positive places too. So it, well, let's use, oh, I don't know how controversial I can get right Go now. for so, it. I mean, hey, this is a, that makes it more fun. <laughs> let's it. talk about society. Let's talk about some of the things going on right now. So there have been um, just, even if we just, let's just look at the political part of it, right? So if there's someone who is, very Republican, and they have someone, maybe their neighbor who's a Democrat, there seems to be more of a split now of, well, if that's what you believe, then you are a bad person or if, or the opposite way, right? Yes. It, it's, yes. There's a split between who you vote for is equal to who you are. But what I'm saying in acceptance is I can accept my neighbor who may have different political views than me, different religious views than me, anything like that because they're a person 
but I don't have to accept and agree with them on some of the things that they do. Um, and I think that's what we're missing. We're saying, well, if this person doesn't do what I want them to do, then I need to cancel them or I need to shut them out or I shouldn't even, uh, you know, have a relationship in any way with them. Now, I'm not saying that we need boundaries. I'm not saying we don't need boundaries. Yeah, exactly. Right, right. There should be boundaries. Yeah. And that's different. I can accept my husband. So if my husband, again, going back to the alcoholic thing, if my husband's an alcoholic and he's doing things to put himself or my family in danger, I draw boundaries around that. I'm not saying that's okay, but I'm still saying as a human being, I see your value and I respect you and I'm not going to let you do things to hurt me, but I'm going to help you try and get help. Yep. And, and that's where that's kind of, that's kind of where it yeah. is. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you're, 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 re, you're suggesting that we'd be required to have some, some depth and some intellect and, uh, and not just be, uh, shallow and, um, uh, what's the word, just kind of rushed to judgment. And so black and white, there's some gray areas in there and, and nuance and things like that, which yeah. it couldn't be more yeah. true. Anyway, please continue. Well, let me share, let me share a story that I think embodies this a little bit better. We had a man call us, this was several years ago now. And, um, and he said, I really need help on getting to a second date. So he wasn't married yet, but he couldn't ever get past the first date, which we said, well, then tell us what's happening on the first date. That's leading women to not want to go on a second date with you. He said, well, you see, the thing is I'm a cross dresser. And when I tell, and I feel like I need to tell women that on the first date, because I don't want them to be surprised. I don't want them to, us to get down in the relationship and then, and then, then see this about me. And then they end up leaving anyway. I feel like I need to be real with them up front. So then we asked him, why are you a cross dresser? To which he said, because when I was six, my dad was abusive. He would beat me. He would harm me. He, there was one time that he even drugged me behind his car, but he never hurt my sister, never laid a hand on her. And so when I dress up like a woman, I feel safe. Now, did your reaction about that man, your judgment of him change once you understood why he did what he did, as opposed to just knowing what he did? Uh, yeah, but it also makes me think he needs still real psychological help. He does. He, <laughs> yeah, so he, should, he experienced trauma in his past. Sure, that sure. does bring that compassion. Needs, yeah, That he needs to get forward. Right. But when we look at this through the lens of acceptance, if there's a difference in just knowing something about a person and then wanting to change it. So if that were me, if I was the woman, then I'm sure if he told me that, that on the first date, I would say, that's not something I accept, right? Like, I don't know how I could accept that. How do, I don't know how to move forward from that. But if I knew why, if I understood why, I would realize this isn't something I need to change about him. This is something, this is, there's a reason he feels this way. There's a reason he does this. I can accept him for who he is, even with this behavior that I, I would not find ideal for a relationship, but I can accept him for it. And that's the key that we're looking at here. There's one thing, it's one thing to just know what someone has done in their past and things like that. It's another thing to know how they feel about it now or how they felt about it when it happened. That's what's going to tell you more about the person. And that's what allows you to accept them, to understand them. And, and that's key. So even then, I don't have to agree with the behaviors. But if I can at least accept and understand why they're happening, it can help me to, to understand and then be a safe place. Because the last thing you want to do is, is have that kind of situation and then I'm constantly, if, like if that were my husband and I didn't understand why it was happening or I wasn't accepting the fact that he did that. And instead of helping him to get help and seeing the reason behind it, if I were attacking him for it or berating him for it, that's not going to help the situation if I just continue to try and make him change. It yeah. doesn't work. No, it doesn't work. Boy, that's good. I, I need to tell people we are talking to Kimberly Holmes, the CEO of Marriage Helper. 
and we're getting into some of the nitty gritty. This is these are the details that will really help you. This is the website, by the way. It's uh, marriagehelper.com, and I will throw that in the chat. And I just clicked on something, but there are lots of resources here. In fact, they just relaunched their uh, relationship radio with Dr. Joe Beam and Kimberly as well. Uh, and so there's podcasts out there. There's uh, you guys do seminars and things like that. Um, we do, yes. Yeah, tell us a little bit about. I, I, now, well, okay. You know what? <laughs> the great thing about my clock is it kind of doesn't matter. So as long as you got time, <laughs> if you if you can get to the rest of, of the four steps uh, in yeah. the attraction thing, uh, I, I I will hang around and hear it. Um, but if you need to go, I want to respect that too. Um, let's do it. But I let's, do want to tell. I, I just want to make sure we hit the seminars at the end here. But yeah, keep going though. This is so good. Okay, great. So attraction is the first step, acceptance, second step. The third step of falling in love is attachment. And this one is real simple. I mean, it's grounded in some really great research. Attachment theory is a really great one. Um, we use a bunch of that, that that explains why this works, but you don't need to know that. What you need to know is that attachment is basically this one thing. I will be there for you when you need me. That's it, because that is how we gain trust. That is how we continue to show we're committed. That's how we show love in action. It's not just words and feelings. It is, I will be there for you when you need me. I will be there for you physically. I will be there for you intellectually to talk to and to, and to have that shoulder to cry on. I'll be there for you emotionally to help you through things. I will be there for you spiritually to help you get back online with your beliefs and values, to be that person to, to, to be that sounding board, that iron that sharpens iron for you. It's the bottom line. Attachment is key because it is what solidifies a relationship together and will keep it together long term. I'm going to I'm going to generalize here and I, I recognize that up front. But do you find that this is the one where men go, yes, and then they have no idea how to do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's your generalization that men yes. don't know how to do this. Yes. Okay. <laughs> yeah. and, and, and I'm generalizing based on myself because this is a woman that I, I'm, I'm sitting here nodding my head and I'm going, Oh, I've totally just not done that in so much of my life. I've been completely blind to it. That's the thing. It's not willful. It's it's blind spot, big time blind spot. Yeah. So that's interesting. I mean, I do think I do think when we look at attachment theory, it's interesting that much of it comes naturally to a maternal nature mm -hmm. because because women are made to be the first attachment to their children. So I do think in some instances and in some ways, it does come more naturally to women. However, I'm not the kind of person to generalize between men and women. So I'm opposite of you. And I'm going to say it probably has more so to just depend on the person because there's definitely this comes on both sides. But if you're looking for some of those ways of how can I be there? So how can I show the other person that I'm there for them? Some of the quickest things are number one, time together. And this isn't quality time. This is quantity time. Because the more time you spend together with a phone not in your face or a screen not in the room, that is gonna help you attach to the other person. Can I have can I have the game on at least? <laughs> Can I have a distraction in the background? Right. Can I do something? Um, no. <laughs> it's true. It's true. Did I interrupt? I'm sorry. No. That yeah. so third stage is attachment, but the fourth yeah. stage, which which is the final stage, this is the one, Randy, that I'm going to tell you is actually the one that most couples never get to. But if they can, it will take the satisfaction they have in their relationship to levels they've never had before. And the fourth one is what we call aspiration. And here's what that means. When, when we first start dating someone, we, we have a shared vision of hopefully getting engaged one day. When we get engaged, we have a shared vision and dream together of planning the wedding. We get married, we have a shared plan of getting the house, having the 2.5 kids with the white picket fence. And then after we have the kids and get into the house, we no longer have shared visions with our spouse. Instead, we get 
really hunkered down in our own careers. We typically have demands of our life that end up taking us apart and we don't have the shared vision that's bringing us back together. And so this fourth stage of aspiration is all about how do you continue to have a dream for you as a couple, a dream for your marriage and what you can do together that you're constantly aspiring to. Because this is what, when you have a vision, then the little things in life that try and distract you or the little stupid fights that you want to have about taking the trash out or whatever it is, they don't matter because you're focused on something bigger and better. You have a goal that you want to get to. And that is the fourth stage of falling in love. I, I don't know if I would have absorbed it or even listened, you know, 25 years ago, but mm -hmm. like I said, we're hitting our 30 year anniversary in, in what, six weeks or so. I've lived this. I have literally lived this. And I mentioned to to Kimberly, for you guys watching, before we started that, you know, right now, we, like, my my hands are gritty from grout and thin set. And my wife and I are, it's it's a little bit nonstop because we're, we are selling our house that we raised four children in. Uh, we don't have a destination yet. Um, but we... We have been getting along great in a high-pressure situation, the two of us. Um, and, I, you know, I, I was thinking, of, just kind of thinking about, like, how, how come my wife and I are getting along? You, know, you usually don't sit back and go, why are we getting along so great? But <laughs> here, she just, Kimberly just, just nailed it. We are moving out of this home in this neighborhood, in this school district, to a place with more space, with a different layout, because we had our first grandchild, uh, December 29th. Uh, our youngest child is getting married in May. We literally, and th the phrase that I've used is we are moving into the grandparents' home. And I know I'm young or getting a head start on it. But we have, my wife and I have the shared vision of having a home that will probably be our, hopefully our last one uh, of our lives where our children can come stay. We want a larger living room so we can gather because now we don't have four children. We have eight, you know, four plus spouses and grandkids. So we need a large living room for Christmas and Thanksgiving and family gatherings. And, and we want a place where the grandkids can come play. We literally are getting through a very difficult process of fixing things and making decisions and spending money that we don't have to, to fix up a house because we have the aspiration of something better together. I, you just, you laid it out. And, and so I just testifying that what you said is true. Before I let you go, um, tell me a little bit about the, the seminars and what's available to people and on your website and through what you're doing. Right. When people go to our website, marriagehelper.com, we have a wealth of resources there. We have tons of videos, articles. We have a free mini course that people can download, especially if they are struggling in their relationship and saying, I, this all sounds great, but I don't even know how to get my spouse to really want to talk to me because we're fighting or, or we just don't like talking to each other anymore. And so we can help with all of those things, but we also love to help couples enhance what they already have and make it better. It's just, Randy, that unfortunately people don't look for help for their marriage to make it better. They look for help for their marriage when it's when it's on its last right. ropes. So, but we, we help with all of it. And the main thing we do, what we're most markedly known for is our three-day turnaround weekend workshops that we have, which are live. We do them either in person or we have online formats right now, but they're still live over a three-day weekend. And it has over a 70% success rate at saving marriages that are on the brink of divorce. But for the marriages that come through that are looking for enrichment or enhancement, those couples say that it is the best thing they have ever done to invest time and effort and energy into making their relationship better. And so you, your listeners can find more about that by going to our website as well. But we would love to have them experience what we do in our weekends. I can totally see how that would be helpful. Th Kimberly, thank you so much. Thank you for that. But that was just really solid. So thank you for your time. Thank you for your expertise. And I encourage people to check out marriagehelper.com as well as Relationship Radio. This is so good. And I, I, I just I can't, re I can't emphasize enough how much this information, when implemented into your marriage, whatever phase it's in, will absolutely bring you more 
happiness, more fulfillment, more joy, more peace. It's uh, it's good, and it'll build it'll build a foundation for your family, uh, and it'll build you know the community and, and the whole nation. I wish everybody would hear this. So thank you, thank you, Kimberly. Thank you so much, Randy. I loved being with you today. And thank you guys for watching. Share this. Good Lord, the whole world needs to hear this. So hit that share button and get it out there. Uh, and if you haven't subscribed or followed Life Today TV, uh, whatever platform you're on, do that now. And you might even check your notifications to make sure you're getting notified when we have more great interviews because we're right here doing this every day, Monday through Friday at noon Central Time. So come back. we got more great interviews this week, next week, week after that. We'll see you next time here on Life Today Live. They want to live the way they want to live and have the Holy Spirit as a bit of uh, something extra. The Holy Spirit must be Lord.